Welcome to Strength in the Numbers. My name is Andrew Codd, accountant, author, and commercial finance entrepreneur. And it's my job each week to bring you leaders in finance and business and deconstruct with them their real stories, insights, and hard-won lessons into practical advice on the key strengths and qualities you need to remain relevant in accounting and finance today, as well as the steps you can begin to take to elevate the impact you make to have a fun, successful, and rewarding career in accounting and finance. Now let's go over to the show. Hi everyone, and welcome to this week's episode of Strength in the Numbers. Now with 26% of top European CFOs eventually becoming a CEO, is it really possible for finance professionals to take on other top CXO roles in business? Well, our guest mentor on this week's episode is Ed Harding, who, although a chartered accountant by his training, has actually worn many hats inside and outside of finance including the CFO, CEO, CEO, just to name but a few. But he's what you could probably call the genuine CXO because he's worn so many hats. So I used to work with Ed and I didn't even know he's done so many roles. So it really has a fascinating career that he shares with us on the show. And because of that career journey, there's really fantastic bits of practical advice and famous names from the world of business started throughout this episode. Uh, some of the things that Ed takes us through is the biggest challenges he faced when stepping out of finance into non-finance related roles. Uh, how he's actually constructed his career story into four pillars to make it an easier job to sell the value of what he does to potential recruiters. Uh, why volunteering is important and Ed's story behind some of those learnings he's picked up. Uh, and also his time as Chief Financial Geek at the Incubator Hack Forward, and also a really cool concept and idea around intelligent simplicity. So look, if you enjoyed the episode, please check out our timestamp show notes, and it's got all our key resources, ways to connect with Ed, and the key quotes from the show. And you can find these at sitnshow.com slash podcast slash 110. So look, really appreciate your time. And if you enjoyed the episode, don't forget to let your friends and colleagues know about it. We're on all the major platforms, iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and YouTube. And without further ado, over to Ed and the show. So, Ed, welcome to the show. Thanks, Andrew. Very nice to be here. Thank you. Now, now Ed, we used to work with each other many moons ago, but some of our audience may not be as uh, familiar with you, and I'm really excited to have you on the show. So would you m- mind perhaps maybe sharing some of your really exciting career journey with us? Yes, yes, certainly. Uh, so I did a business degree uh, and followed up with chartered accountancy, uh, doing everything in a medium-sized firm, Mazars, from accounts prep to audit, internal, external, um, management consultancy, and set up a corporate finance practice. And left to go to London, investment banking first with with Warburg, and setting up an internet bank in the 1990s, then to uh, wealth management out in Zurich, running Europe and then global financial financial analysis in the central team for UBS Wealth. Then I went to Coots, where I became the CFO for Coots UK, and did a major turnaround in their financial performance there. And then since 2006, I've kind of gone off the rails a bit as an accountant and done a number of other interesting things as well. Sometimes as, as an interim, uh, sometimes in, in sort of shorter term, you know, shorter term consultancy assignments as well. But I've been in Asia with the banking crisis, selling banks for RBS as an independent. I was a company troubleshooter for Direct Line Group, getting them ready for IPO. I've run London's largest owner-occupied hotel group, 4,000 rooms in London, as the CEO and CFO there. Ran a tech fund for a while. We met at RSA uh, back in 2011, I think that was. Yeah, around there. I remembered. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so a number of different bits and pieces. Uh, the two constants that I've got are I'm vice chairman of uh, professional standards group for the Institute of Chartered Accountants. So I'm vice chairman of the Investment Business Committee, which is a uh, quasi-judicial body. And if you'll find us on the naughty page at the back of the Economia magazine. And the second thing I do is I'm a mentor for the Mayor of London, his uh, international growth program, which is for London's fastest growing tech companies, split life sciences, fintech and urban growth. And I support those businesses as well. Look, look Ed, that, that's just an amazing journey. I don't, don't know if our audience have picked up on it, but you've worked for many different brands and wore many different hats. And, and still manage to, to mentor and give back to our profession. So I suppose in terms of that journey, 
what's giving you the confidence to wear so many hats i mean like is it in, is it in our training is it our qualification is that something you've always wanted to do like how 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 did you get the confidence to wear so many hats well i th- i think my confidence i guess to do different jobs uh, comes from my interest in business my ability uh, i think is all down to my training so i had an incredible training with mazars where i touched on everything from from building a set of accounts out of a shoe box of receipts uh, through to auditing very large companies to raise money. And I've honestly found since then, I found it quite easy to see the overall picture of a business because I've in the past had to build a financial picture for them, uh, for my clients back when I started out of these shoe boxes. I've never lost the interest in doing that and I've never lost the ability to sort of, uh, to sort of dig into stuff and uh, take what looks quite complicated and turn it to something quite simple. But finance is, is a, it's an incredible passport if you qualify as an accountant. I love that expression, a passport, because like, you know, you, you've used it obviously as your passport to the, to the other roles, so the COO, the CEO. Um, is there any CXO role you've not done? <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, as well. Um, I don't know. I mean, I've, 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 I was the COO at Hitachi Capital, and I had about four or 500 guys working for me. The CTO worked for me, the HR team worked for me, uh, finance, uh, risk. So yeah, I've probably covered most of them now, I think. Yeah, I, I, so I mean, I suppose it, it's quite easy, like I suppose for us to see how it's a great passport to these, these roles that are non-traditionally finance. But I suppose what would have been the main or the biggest challenges that you encountered as you stepped from finance into these other CXO type roles? I think when you move out of out of the finance department, I think it's a really useful exercise, first of all, to move outside of finance and to come back in or to or to take the finance message outside of the function. I think it's a, a critical part of what accountants need to do in the future. A lot of the basic accountancy work will in the end, I think, be automated. And so it's the values of the finance uh, and it's the qualities of rigor and uh, and discipline I think that finance people have that I think will be valuable and I think that will be everywhere. The last thing I found is that actually finding the right badge for yourself I found really difficult and it's particularly difficult for recruiters to sell if you like a generalist into what is effectively still a specialist market. So quite often if you're looking to be a CFO in a private bank let's say and you need to have been a CFO in a private bank before or be on the route to being a CFO in a private bank, having worked in one for the last 10 years. I think necessarily subscribe to that opinion. I think uh, someone moving across functions and across industries can bring a completely different insight and and so new thought into a, into a business. So I believe in the use case for it, but I'm, I have honestly struggled a bit trying to sell the story. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think, and I think, uh, no, that certainly resonates with me. I thought that was the right way to do it as um you know picking up these different brands these different hats working inside and outside of finance i thought that'd be very useful and then i suppose as a when i embarked on being an intro myself like like i did find that quite hard as being sold as a generalist and I, I just found it's much easier now and i suppose in the corporate world being a specialist but so how have you tried to make sense of it all ed i mean there's plenty of our audience that are probably feeling similar and, and there's also recruiters listening to this show. So, you know, is there is there a path we can pick our way through or is there some sort of things we can hang our hats on to reinforce to uh, potential employers or where we can add value? The, the, the I suppose the advantages of hiring someone with such a, a diverse set of experiences. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, so I think you I think you you you're always the best seller of yourself. So nobody else can sell you as well as you can. I just I try and cut through the so I've, I've done a number of really interesting things or things that I found interesting and things I've grown with and grown from. What I've done is I've created a story, which is I have uh, four pillars to my career. So I have financial services. So I've been all the way across financial services from insurance to wealth to retail and commercial banking and trading. Uh, I've, so that's financial services. I've got finance as a subject matter, and I've been a CFO in a number of outfits and worked up through the other jobs as well, all the way through. Uh, I've got transformation and change, um, which includes m uh, and any kind of crisis, basically non-BAU. That's my third pillar. So if it's tricky, um, then I'm interested and I'm someone to speak to. And the last one is technology, or let's call it technology and disruption. So uh, for that last one, I've spent a long time working with early stage technology companies, 
that's the place where I'm getting my thought leadership from that I can take to the big companies and I take the big company experience to the small companies. So it's, it's a really great source of keeping me fresh and relevant and interested in new operating models coming out. So the way I say it is I've got these four pillars, financial services, finance, um, change and technology. If, if you're looking for someone to fill uh, a job and you need two of those skills, then I could be useful. With three of them, we should definitely be having a chat. And with four of them, then I'm the absolutely the first person to speak to. Yeah, yeah but, but see how you built that story up. That was very uh, coherent, right? And obviously you had a lot of experience getting getting there. But but how did you come across that idea in terms of um, breaking it out into the four pillars? I think that's a fantastic bit of advice for our audience. But is there any sort of ideas to um, to get people going on that, that journey similar to yours in terms of identifying their, their pillars? Yeah, certainly. I think uh, when you're a permanent employee in a company, um, you have all manner of support mechanisms to keep you uh, developing and learning and progressing in your career with the company, and also making sure you're you know you're going to constantly add and add more value in the business that you're. When you are an interim, um, and I've been doing it since 2007, you go from having you know I'm, I'm married with one daughter. Uh, so I go from having 500 people working for me to basically being the least important person in a family of three. <laughs> <laughs> and in this thing. But in between assignments, it's quite interesting. You have these periods of reflection, uh, periods of, sort of, of time off and regrouping what you're going to do next. And you hope other people are out there trying to sell you for your next assignment, the recruiters. What I've found is that there isn't a, there is only one product for me or there is only one of me. Uh, so it doesn't scale very well with other people. So I've got to come up with my story for what I am. And that's the, I think that's the thing. You, uh, the, the advice I'd give is please try early on to work out exactly what you are. And you're not going to find it all yourself. It's really important to speak to other people and to create these support mechanisms that are going to help you identify what you are and what other people value, by the way. That's really important. Uh, and then to take that and try and package that into a product you can sell. Um, so, so what I've done is, does that make sense? A hundred percent. Keep going, Ed. I love it. So what I've done, I've, I always ask people when I'm on assignment, look, if, you know, if you, if you're pleased with what you've seen, please, uh, you know, write, write a LinkedIn recommendation because all of these feedback loops help me understand how I'm perceived in the market and help keep me accurate to what I am. So it's like marketing to market my product. Yeah. I'm constantly getting feedback. I got to a point, I got 50 odd recommendations on LinkedIn. And it's kind of, I'm so grateful for everyone giving me that, that information because it's sometimes you just don't see stuff if you're doing it yourself. I've actually taken it one step further uh, recently uh, and I've hired this amazing marketing uh, expert. And what she's done is she's helped me go back into my CV and break down exactly what it is that I've done and to try and unpack my experience and repackaging up into smaller chunks than just a one-year contract, let's say. So she's tried to get to the essence of Ed, which has been really, really useful. So she's productized Ed, <laughs> which is brilliant, which will help me scale. Love it. I love it. <laughs> but, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, I think it's oh. quite an interesting exercise. And if it was, if this was a, if I was in a consultancy firm, like, I mean, I joined Deloitte in 2015 to go and be a partner in a Swiss practice to go and run Finance mm -hmm. Transformation. It's a great business. Um, but it's a consulting business. It's not, a, it's not a business run by operators. So the guys there are experts at the finance transformation practice of Deloitte and, and running out their processes. They're not experts at running finance functions. They've never done it. So that's why I was going up. But the gap between consulting and operating was just too big a leap for me. I'm what well, we've worked together before, Andrew, so you know that I'll roll my sleeves up, pile into stuff and try and create a bundle of energy that people can sort of, it's almost like a big snowball of fizziness to try and get people moving and, and enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, that's hard to do through somebody else's process. So I thought, well, I'm, I'm going to actually try and build my own. And what we've worked out I'm really good at is, um, is going into huge amounts of, well, the most complex areas of a business. Um, and I'll dive into the detail with the experts of the business, the people that run the business, and I'll help them remove some of the clutter that's built up around the outside of their core processes and their core uh, the core business and in doing that you've then got the essence of the business um that you can then grow and transform it's very difficult to transform something that's messy it's very easy to transform something that is uh, that is clean 
because uh, you can see what it is you've got to change. Your from state is much easier. If you look at sort of companies like Airbnb and Uber and the, the newer, newer, younger, smarter, uh, exponential organizations, um, those guys, they have no legacy thinking. They have no, it's very simple for them to grow quickly. And that's why it's so hard for the incumbent businesses to change. So I'm looking at all areas of friction in big companies so that I can close the gap between them and these new exponential organizations. Yeah. So it's really, it's, it's growing with intelligent simplicity is what, I, is what I'm doing. <laughs> intelligent simplicity. I lo- love that expression. And 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 I suppose look, I, I I think you've given a great example as to what that is, and and I I suppose um, I suppose our audience are really going to benefit from that. I, I suppose in terms of what you're working on now, Ed, what's exciting you most about your current work? Uh, well, I think having a having a, a new product um, to to work with is really exciting. I'm working at the moment with a small crypto mining business. I did a bit of work with them a couple of weeks ago. They've called me today for some more work. That's fascinating. Really interesting looking at the the trade of or the arbitrage of uh, the cost of energy and the power consumption and delivery or yields of mining chips. These things are completely new, different businesses, but fascinating. I really urge everybody to try and get involved in something as well as your perhaps your, your normal role of working for a large corporate, also having a look at some of the new stuff that's out there. Because yep. you'll find things that you've read you read in the press or whatever, but you just getting involved is easier than you think, and you've got an awful lot to add. Yeah, that, that's, that's probably a question on people. I, by the way, I completely support what you're saying, Ed. I, I couldn't agree with it more. I have a massive soft, soft spot for smaller organizations and startups. And and like you know, you know when you say it's easier than you think to get involved, like how, how do you get involved with a startup like that? Well, I think, in fact, these guys found me um, this time. But the first one I did, well, the first one was an internet bank, uh, which was that, that was quite a big one actually. But the first startup I did, <laughs> the first startup I did was um, building a, a music business, a music gaming business with uh, some family members of U2. And I was introduced by a lawyer, <laughs> <laughs> so it was quite, it was quite good. It was iTunes meets Google Pursuit meets Facebook. Oh wow! Um, uh, but yeah. <laughs> At the time we were trying to build a social network and then Facebook came along. <laughs> we were probably building the wrong thing. <laughs> but uh, I've worked with, I think volunteering is useful. Nobody buys something that's untested. I made myself available to a number of different projects that I was interested in. Met some really great people that I continue to work with you know, regularly. I, volunteer, I got picked up by a group called Hack Forward, um, which was, I don't know if you know Z. Zing, xing.com yes I the do. founder of zing yes oh my goodness wow yeah so lars henriks founded zing and sold it i think he made millions uh, tens of millions uh, on the exit in the early 30s and he uh, so he did very well uh, and he realized that the guys that made the money out of the business or a lot of the guys that created value were the suits whereas whereas in his words it was the geeks and the coders and the developers that that generated the true value so he had a, a thesis he sat down and worked with IDEO and had a, had a thesis of, can we make the geeks into CEOs? Can they run their own businesses? So I got approached actually through Lars's wife, who was best friends with a private banker in Switzerland, <laughs> um, who I worked out there. And she said, you know, I'm looking for, my husband's looking for an uh, entrepreneurial CFO. Do you know any? And so Mara, uh, Dr. Mara, Dr. Mara Harvey. Um, said, yeah, I know this guy, Ed, you should definitely speak to him. So I got a strange phone call saying, or well, great phone call saying, hey, connect. I met Lars, uh, and then with Lars um, and a couple of other people, uh, David, who is one of the first Google people into Europe, and Tom Hume, who is the now the Google Venture Partner for Europe, but was the, uh, uh, was the head of IDEO in London. Really super smart design agency, and Tom's just a genius, I think. Um, he's on TED, you'll find him there. So we set up this thing, Hack Forward, uh, and from there that became a, another badge, and that comes with it. When you get the badge, you get the you know the pull of other people coming in and being interested to speak to you. That's that's a great. That's and look, I love the way you t- took us through that journey, Ed, because the fundamental it fundamentally starts. It might not necessarily involve paid work. It's maybe that volunteering, but it's actually taking action to do something, to start something up, to get involved with people. Obviously, much easier if if you're working with other people and all on your yeah. own. But then it attracts um, the right level of experiences, the other resources towards you. And 
I imagine they were quite fun activities to get involved in. Uh, am I right, right in that? Um, they, they were they fun? Oh, it, it was absolutely brilliant. They, they had a video on the first, I, I gave the keynote speech on the first build event. Every three months we took 10 or 12 different group uh, startups to uh, Mallorca to go and work on their strategy and help them develop. We bought amazing thought leaders together to help them. First, the first build event, I was the, uh, I was the speaker, or one of the speakers, and I talked about the meaning of geek, and I looked into and developed, you should check out the story, it's on passionmeetswithmentor.com. But I went through um, and discussed what it, what, it means, uh, what it means to be a geek, and that geek, geek was actually, because I thought it was a detrimental term or a derogatory term, turns out it's actually, it's actually not. Um, <laughs> and it was a fantastic session. Uh, or fantastic day um, and from there I badged myself as the instead of the CFO I called myself the chief financial geek <laughs> and then Lars said well I'm going to be the chief executive geek and David became the chief talent geek oh, gas. so <laughs> so we made geek part of it and then the video was called they did a really awesome video it was really good but the voice wasn't great so I suggested we, we had someone like Stephen Fry do the voiceover and Tom organised that and Stephen Fry did the did the voiceover on our awesome video and we had fifty thousand hits on the first day and it was just it was absolutely excellent so and working with those guys uh, and working with truly dynamic really fast people that had very little in front of them in terms of what we built already but had all of the optimism and capability behind them there was a lot of confidence that we were going to do something cool and we did do something really cool and interesting um and i think uh Whilst hack forward isn't uh, doesn't doesn't exist now, the experiment you know, always was a kind of an interesting experiment of what was going to happen next. It proved, I think, the case for how, how to sort of develop, not necessarily incubate, but help sort of accelerate businesses in a in a structured, organised way. So, uh, what is space? I'd like to at one point have a hack forward 2.0 or different name, but you know something else in the future. I strongly believe in the model. Well, in anticipation of that, Ed, I, I encourage our audience to watch this space as well. And there you go. If there's any any um, budding finance, uh, I suppose, startup minded people, entrepreneurial finance people out there looking to hone their skills, you know, you could be um, you could have a ready ready made a list of our participants in, in 2.0 so uh that's, that sounds amazing I, that really does uh, but i'm not surprised to have worked together ed like that that's um you, you know you're very entrepreneurial so so thank you for sharing that and you know i suppose then looking more onto the technical side of things aicpa and sema there's a, a conference coming up and you're you're on a very esteemed list of speakers some of them have been on this show but are you looking forward to that i'm really looking forward to it yeah yeah uh talking on monday about the the DNA of the uh, of the future CFO, and how um, how the role of CFO has developed over time. It's it's a it's a great subject. Uh, I think we're moving we're moving from a period of uh, people living with this huge complexity, and CFOs effectively optimizing their existing models the best they can, I guess to a uh, to a budget or, or to a rationed capital. And I think we're moving into a world of where the CFO is going to be the data opportunist. So these the future CFO, in my eyes, is someone that doesn't just look after the financial numbers, but becomes the, I guess, the guardian of data generally in an organisation. I think we're best the best place people in the business to do that. I, that vision really much resonates with me, Ed. Uh, but are those for some of our audience, then why why would you why would you see that vision being a reality? Yeah, well, I, th I think uh, I think what we've had in the past is we've had you look back and say, well, from the moment you entered. Uh, entered the finance profession, uh, Andrew, uh, like me, you've probably been dealing with, at the start, you, you're in the world of reconciliations uh, yes. and solving uh, the most horrible substantive tests and, and ways of proving that a number is right. Yeah. yeah. So you spend a hell of a lot of time at the start of your career. Well, if, you're, if you've been in finance for a while, I've been in 25 years now. So if you've been in business for a while, looking back 25 years, I spent most of my time at the start learning the art and science of finance, but also learning how to prove historic figures were right. Mm. Not trying to catch people out, an audit is designed to give people confidence uh, for the future. But basically it's, it's, it's providing a line in the sand to say that the past was accurate. Now I think, I think with machine learning in the future, or more machine learning, I think with 
greater volumes of data that come into a business from not just from inside the business but external data market data all the stuff you can get from let's say google analytics or from from a million sources um, all of this data uh, requires somebody to provide some kind of a quality stamp and to give give some assurance to the business that this data is in some way reliable or that it was collected in the same way same way this month as it was last month so if you like the single version of the truth that everyone's been trying to get to with finance numbers for the last 20 years, I'm not, I'm not saying we need this kind of a, a net neutrality challenge where finance censors data, um, but I think having someone with the finance qualification and extending their remit to include data science, I think it's a really smart way to make sure that we have the reliability and the appropriateness and the sufficiency of the data. Uh, in the future that we're going to need 100 yeah. percent. i mean ultimately in the end of the day the numbers we report out are i suppose the litmus test of the decisions we've made uh, how successful we've been and you know if the data we're using to base those decisions on isn't in any way accurate or is it well short of accurate then those decisions may not be as good as they could be so it's it makes complete sense as a very important way of improving the numbers it's completely completely aligned well, yeah i mean the hotel group i work work for but they had a you indulged me for a second on on hotels it's a fascinating area uh, it's something i've not really not really thought of before going there but in the hotel industry you have this particular job which is to manage revenue okay and you think okay revenue manager forward what's that involve and if you imagine sort of layering a cake and you've got a hundred rooms in a, in a hotel or 200 rooms in a hotel um you don't just wait to sell those rooms on the day you're obviously trying to pre-sell some of them and you want to leave some of them available on the market but planning for that that's really really difficult um so it's a bit like done like a plane where you know the plane is taking off in gatwick and landing in ibiza um and 200 people get on and 200 people get off with a hotel room every person joins at different times. Uh, sometimes they arrive wearing different hats. They might be there on, on pleasure, they might be there on business. Uh, they, they all have requirements, they all want different things. And so sometimes the, the hotel will have to work out how to optimize that room to get the most revenue out of it. So what we did there was we looked at um, how much of the room, how many of the rooms had to be pre-sold on the conference circuit. So there was an annual, annual sort of conference session where blocks of rooms were bought by kpmg for their accountants to stay there or uh, or whatever other big group then there was uh, you overlay on top of this first layer of conference stuff you overlay on top of it things like well it's, this is the shopping season for the spanish and they always come over at this period and it's a, it's an incredible incredibly predictable but quite on the face of it complex data set and if you can imagine year on year the accuracy and predictability of this, this you know, the shape of this cake gets better and better and better. And the, it's kind of one of the best things I've seen in terms of an accurate data set. We did conjoint analysis on 20 different criteria of every stay to work out which was the least the most convincing reason why someone would return. And we did this for every room. So we didn't just get reviews on the, on the hotel, we got reviews on the rooms. So the level of data and the level of accuracy in the data was improving all the time. And with that, improved data you get greater predictability so i wouldn't bring you back to finance i wouldn't be surprised going forwards if we actually managed to get to the essence of these business models got to the real simple truth and discovered that actually quite a lot of this is quite predictable on the face of it it looks different or difficult to predict but some of it's really easy to predict and i think we'll therefore be looking at planning cycles of what's going to happen next week what's going to happen in the next hour when we get to that i think data is everything so i want to make sure we've got the right tools the data tools available to us in finance come back on the curve and to really start looking forwards with much more accuracy with much greater precision in you know, a shorter precision of time frame appreciate you know going into into that Ed, because on the one hand we know what the outcomes in theory should look like in terms of good quality numbers out and on the other hand our training really should be preparing us for delving in doing those those reconciliations those hard yards rolling the sleeves up to get the data right to get it lined up in the right way and um that that's so yeah. important i think you know as you said that that is a very strong passport into the future is fine it's not just amongst many other hats or any other roles also a passport into a very good future where where influential members of the organizations and involved in meaningful decisions so ed thank you very much for that and again i want to be respectful of your time you've given us loads of great advice what's been the best bit of advice you've ever received uh, i think i think be enthusiastic and energetic um, if you're not 
if you don't feel enthusiastic and energetic about what you're doing, then it's quite likely you're in the wrong place. If you're leading people, you have to you have to inspire them to do great things. Words like empowerment are really, really important. Um, but you're not going to empower anybody if you're not enthusiastic in the first place. So I think having energy and turning up like you're excited, like I am when I go to work, um, it's not work. It's, it's fun. fun yeah. And when it's fun, you do things. Yeah. So I think um, my dad sums it up. He said to me, when my brother and I were starting off as accountants. He said, don't live to work and don't work to live, but live at work and be you at work and you always get the best out of everything if you do that I, i'm a bit jealous you had such great advice like that at a very young age but um but that's no no i, I appreciate you sharing that with us and and you've also mentioned a number of resources along the way so i'll i'll make sure that they end up in the show notes ed but in terms of yourself are there are any particular resources that you you use yourself that you find particularly useful yeah yeah uh so a few basic ones investopedia um is my go-to place for when somebody says something. Uh, I always say if I don't understand something, or please explain what that is, because I think it's best to always ask and, and, and learn quickly. The place I go to first to learn quickly some things is um, is Investopedia. It's a brilliant resource. Yeah, definitely. Um, check that out. Um, the other thing is I'm an avid consumer of podcasts such as this now. Thank you for introducing me. Uh, and I've subscribed and I've listened to it. Uh, but, I, but there's one book I can strongly recommend, which is um, Salim Ishmael's book on exponential organizations. Uh, and this describes the operating model of Airbnb, Uber, and the exponential organization being one that can grow at an exponential rate. Um, typically new companies with uh, unicorn price tags, as we know. But they're great. It is a great read. Uh, get it on Audible. You can play at one and a half speed and get through it quicker. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you're giving away all our tips and tricks here. <laughs> That's great. And look, and those those types of books are fascinating for anyone curious about business models in the future. Like they're very they're very useful to understand and get a sense of the business model. So, uh, thanks for recommending that one for audience. Ed, great recommendation. And and you know, if there's any uh, members of our audience who'd like to continue the conversation, uh, where's the best place to connect with you at? Well, there's two places now. So um, thanks for thanks for that. So first of all, on LinkedIn, I'm on LinkedIn. Everyone on there I've worked with and can recommend. So what I'd like to do, is, if your readers or listeners are interested in connecting, let's do something together, uh, and then we can connect on LinkedIn. But please make an introduction through LinkedIn, uh, and then then we can start a conversation. The place to look at what I do is e2o.com, um, and this is where the, the business that I've I've uh, I have now, which is looking at intelligent simplicity and how to drive value and growth into businesses. I'd love to work with you there. I, I, by the way, in terms of that, I've checked that website out and there's some really good resources and the way you break it down on your website, Intelligent Simplicity, I'll really like that, Ed. So I encourage our audience to go check that out as well. And I suppose, Ed, you know, again, being respectful of your time, do you, would you have any parting thoughts for our audience? I just, well, first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's been brilliant talking to you again, Andrew, and look forward to meeting up again soon, hopefully in London. <laughs> yes. The other thing I'd say is just, please accountants everywhere um stay close to your institutes um, and try and become active uh, in supporting them because i think you know, the, what, what what a finance qualification represents and it, let's face it they're difficult to get uh, i really struggled qualifying it took me a year and a half to get one percent on my final tax exam oh my God. Yeah. <laughs> um to get me over the, over the edge but um but they're worth it and when you're in it, I think it's it's a, it's a mistake to just be a passive member. I think it's a really great idea to get involved. And they'll only remain relevant if we remain interested and keep it interesting. That's so true. So get involved. That's, no, Ed, that's so true. Thank you. I really thank you for reinforcing that point. So thank you very much for that. And look, thank you for being a great guest and showing us uh, the way of, of you know taking on roles outside of finance, the idea about you know our qualifications as passports, how we can leverage our earlier training into being relevant for the future as well and also supporting our institutes. So, Ed, thanks for coming on our show and being such a great guest and investing your time with us today. Thank you very much, Andrew. Great to speak to you. So there you have it. Hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to know more about our guests today, their bio, and follow up on the resources mentioned during the show, you can find all the relevant links and more at sitnshow.com. There you'll also be able to get access to earlier shows, read the latest blogs. There's also an opportunity to subscribe to our newsletter. 
which will give you heads up as to when the next show is coming out, latest events, news and anything that's going to be relevant to help you have a fun, rewarding and successful career in finance and accounting. And just before you go, we really appreciate your feedback. If there's something we can do better on the show, something that's not working or something you'd like to see, even a guest you'd like for us to invite onto the show, someone who you think might be able to benefit you more and also the rest of our community, please let me know. You can email me. I'm at andrew at sitnshow.com or feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Just drop me a message so I know how you found me and we can connect. And really, it's our community that will make the show. If we keep engaging and driving each other on, we'll keep on building our strength in the numbers. And when all is said and done, if we can do the numbers better and finance better, we'll create more opportunities for ourselves, our friends, our families, our communities and our businesses. So until next time, have a good rest of the week. Take care and let's keep building our strength in the numbers.